I'm Father James Coles. I'm the pastor of St. Ignatius of Antioch in Mesa, uh, Arizona, suburb of Phoenix. I've been here 19 years, almost 20 years. The parish has been around almost 25. We have a very beautiful campus that was given to us right at the very beginning, the end of 2019, the beginning of COVID, and we moved in here January of 2020 been here ever since. I haven't always been Orthodox, and I didn't even know about Orthodoxy. I grew up Roman Catholic in Dallas, Texas. Got involved with a ministry, youth ministry, called Young Life as a kid in the middle of high school. Wound up being a volunteer leader and going to camps and different things. Met my wife at one of the properties that's in Southwest Colorado, very beautiful place. We dated long distance through college. I was a volunteer leader and still going to the Catholic Church and wound up, once I graduated from college, moving to Tucson, Arizona, where she was still in college. Got a job working at an Episcopal church doing youth work. I had a young life, youth work kind of component, like a partnership, and did that for a couple of years. And uh, she had grown up Baptist, and so we met kind of in between or whatever you can say in the Episcopal Church. And then I took Episcopal kids, wound up taking a job in Southern California in the Episcopal Church doing youth work. We took Episcopalian kids to the Holy Land. And it was in the Holy Land where I was reading every book on the Desert Fathers I could get a hold of. It was really introduced to Orthodoxy with the churches, going to the Church of the Resurrection and the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem and all the places and it, the icons, everything just really spoke to the transcendence of God and really grabbed hold of me and kept reading, came back, wound up taking a job in doing Young Life again in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So moved to Santa Fe, my wife's pregnant with our, we got married, my wife's pregnant with our oldest, a daughter. And uh, anyway, we moved to Santa Fe so I could work for Young Life. But there's this great little connection in, in Santa Fe with this Episcopal priest named uh, Father John Bethencourt. So it was at that church in Santa Fe that we converted from the Episcopal Church. He converted from the Episcopal Church, the Orthodox Church, and we followed him about probably about eight, six months or a year after he did. Yeah, it was with Father John. So we I was doing Young Life, I was Orthodox, and then I decided to go to seminary with his blessing and wound up going to seminary in New York. And then that was, that was in 2000. Yeah, that was my conversion. I think uh, the Roman Catholic background made it kind of easy to convert. Like it was simple, kind of a simple kind of like fulfilling of that or the next step for me. And um, I didn't find liturgy foreign like some people might, you know, made like I found a, I found a deeper home. I found a place that I really uh, could put down my guard and put down roots. So here we are. I think in truth, like growing up as a Catholic kid, I was always interested in the priesthood. I was also really interested in girls. <laughs> so I don't know how that sounds, but anyway, hopefully not too weird. But yeah, so I mean, I was like, not going to be a priest in the Catholic church, you know, and, but when once, you know, again, it was like the, the fulfillment came later, the like desire was first, like, it'd be great to serve the Lord that way somehow stand at the altar in innocence and baptize people and all of that and preach the word. And then the call of really through Father John's life, wanting, wanting to live that Narnaic, Narnian lifestyle. Like I wanted to be in the kingdom and, uh, and being, being involved in Young Life, giving talks, like there's a natural kind of progression to go from being with people and loving them and speaking of Christ. So it felt like the next step. And I know the Lord really led me in it. So it is a very common experience, at least for me, it may be true of many Orthodox priests, but I receive at least an email a week, sometimes two uh, or more where people write me and it's been happening for years, although it's happening all the time now. People write and they say, I'm a whatever, you know, I'm, I don't go to church or more often it's I'm Protestant or Roman Catholic and I've been listening to videos, I've been reading books, and I went to your website and I live in this part of Phoenix or whatever it is, and I'm ready to be baptized or I'm ready to convert or I don't want to be baptized, but I want to become Orthodox or whatever the questions are. But it, what's interesting, my, I, I'm gonna, I should just write like a template uh, for an email response that says, dear so-and-so, thank you so much for reaching out. It's really great you're interested in Orthodoxy. I love that you've read books and seen videos. Have you actually been to a service in the Orthodox Church? Because 
there's kind of orthodoxy, internet orthodoxy, and then there's orthodoxy. And I'm not like anti videos or whatever is out there, but I think the, the only way to know is to visit an orthodox church. The only way to know, and, and in fact, people will say, you know, the, I'm ready, I just need to meet with the priest. And I actually right now say, no, the first thing you need to do is actually just come to a service. So please come, please come Saturday night to Vespers, something easy, you know, something where there's not a thousand people and please come and you can, I'll say hi to you after and meet some people. And we have a catechumen class and, and all of that we put people through. So part of responding to those emails is please come, I'll say hi to you. We can get to know each other and then you can come to the classes. And, and then you really get kind of a question and answer interaction with the priest rather than just, you know, I'm doing my own research and it's probably fine and I'm ready, you know? So I love that that's happening. Uh, there's people at our parish that are like, how are these people finding us? Like, how is this happening? I'm like, I, it's just happening. Like the Lord's doing it and he's doing it all kinds of fun ways. Yeah, I mean, I, today, we're filming, it's a Thursday. I've received two emails this week saying, I'm ready, or, you know, I'm, I'm gonna come, can I come? What do I need to do? What do, I, what do I have to wear or something, you know? Like, what do I do? It's like, you should just come, you should just come. You should come and see it and try to participate. That was the other thing I'd say is like, people come and they wanna observe and there's no observing worship. You just have to kind of come and even if it's foreign to someone, they just need to come and like be in it, you know, see it smell it, like feel it, like be in it and not worry, not worry. Just be at the service and stand when people stand or whatever it is and just try to try to pray. And people are doing it. It's incredible. When people do right and they ask about coming, sometimes they ask about confession. They'll specifically ask, do I have to confess my sins to a priest or can I just go to God directly? And what I've said and it's, I took this from someone else. I didn't make this up. But what we say is confession is the secret heart of orthodoxy. Because the path we're on is a path of repentance. You know, we're not on like a path that's like comfort or something. It's a path of like looking at yourself. And when we see ourselves as we really are, we see what the Lord's up to, but we also see our sin. And in orthodoxy, I don't know how it is outside of orthodoxy, but confession is still a really important like discipline for the orthodox with the priest, standing with the priest in this unusual, amazing conversation, the most unique conversation anybody ever has, a therapeutic conversation, but not like with a therapist so much as with the Lord. So in typical like orthodox fashion for confession, there's not a booth, People have asked about booths. There's not a booth. Um, you either sit the way I'm sitting and someone sits kind of with me, facing me. And more often than not, you wind up standing together, shoulder to shoulder in front of an icon of Christ. And the most important person of the three, the one who is hearing the confession, the one who is confessing, and then the Lord, the most important person is Christ. And so the priest is not there the priest is not really receiving the confession even. The priest is a witness to the, your repentance. The priest is a, you know, and a witness even to the Lord for someone's repentance, a witness to you of his absolution and forgiveness. And, um, and, and a witness to the community that we're all struggling to confess our sins and, and find that grace, obtain, like, obtain the grace of God not just through worship and not just through the other disciplines, but also through this secret heart of, of not carrying our own burdens, of not pretending we're not sinning, you know, of not getting in the mindset that, oh, everybody, fill in the blank, everybody does this. And instead going and standing before the Lord and saying, I've sinned, I don't wanna do it anymore. I mean, that's the whole punchline. I know I did it. Now the Lord knows that I know I did it. I mean, that's the secret to confession. The Lord already knows, why do you have to confess? So now he knows that you know. And then we rely on him. And that, the secret heart of orthodoxy is really being intimate with the Father in truth. But how do you get there? It's got to be through a path of repentance. Daily repentance. Not an obsession with sin, but like 
maybe say obsession, like obsession with the grace of God, like turning to the Lord, wanting him, you know, and wanting to be honest, you know, before God and with ourselves. And then the priest is there to witness that happening. And, you know, we could talk more about confession, but priests really aren't free ever to share what someone says in confession. Never, honestly, priests don't even share it with themselves, much less their spouses or friends or something, or, you know, bishops or the police or whatever. It's like, it's just gone. That is an amazing thing to be a priest, to witness that, to watch. I mean, I've literally seen like children skip away from confession and basically adults do too, but they just don't skip. <laughs> but they leave that like to have your heart made light. It's an incredible thing. That's actually a really good question. You know, why can't you just confess directly to God? And the answer is you can and you should. Like confession should be our whole path, you know, like, like confessing and running back to the Lord, turning back from sin, running back to the Father who's waiting for us and runs to greet us. But yeah, the priest actually isn't a middleman. Yeah, I wouldn't, I don't like middlemen either. Priest is not, a, I mean, it wouldn't make really make sense the priest is the middleman. But there's no accountability and people usually don't have any kind of victory in just, I mean, people should do their own, like be honest with themselves. Like if you confess the sin, do you find the grace to sin no more? in doing that. And if, if the church is right, and I don't understand why we wouldn't trust the church being right on this, it's been what's been handed down for generations. Spoken of in the scripture, you know, James says, confess your sins to one another. But the disciples really took that. The Lord really gave them what they needed through the laying on of hands to carry burdens and to, to offer them to the Lord. So, yeah, the priest isn't a middleman, but is a witness, like stands there. So, and I said, as much as it's not therapy, that kind of work can't be done alone. Like just, so people, but people should confess. Absolutely. Every day, every night should confess directly to the Lord. And then there's times when you go and there's like a sacramental connection with the kingdom that needs to also be part of it. And not just a prayer alone, but in the community, a witness. You know, everybody knows this probably, but the early church, you confessed aloud in the congregation. And that is going on, just it's been where the priest now is kind of representing that in a way to you. Like the priest is hearing these confessions, but he's not the most important part of confession. Christ is. So to stand there and to have a priest who knows you and loves you, and when you show up and you come back to confession and you say, I can't believe I have to confess the same things. To have someone there who says, the Lord has forgot, forgiven you. Like, you've repeated it and the Lord understands and forgives you. And, in, in, and then if, there's, if it's necessary to be given like medicine for the healing of our souls, like how do we get that alone? Like you can't. To have the priest say, you know what would be helpful? Go read 2 Corinthians. You know, go read go read the gospel of John slowly, you know, go for, go and return that item, you know, well, they stole it, but nobody notices. And it's not that big a deal. And I'm not attached. And then have the priest say, no, you still have to go give it back. And to go, I'm really glad I gave it back. You know, so people, I think people that say, I don't need a priest to confess have not ever had a priest to confess. So they don't know. It's like, they don't understand the grace that the priest is a witness to as well. It's not the priest, but the priesthood, like that there's, I mean, and I grew up with a kind of a weird system in the Roman Catholic church, forgive me for saying so, but we weren't, it wasn't like very therapeutic. It was like, go pray a number of Hail Marys or, or our fathers as the penance. And the pe more like the penance in the Orthodox church is go give it back. No, you have to call your son. No, you should go to that wedding. I'm not going to that wedding. Yeah, you're going to the wedding. You have to. And that's the kind of penance. I mean, there's other, there's medicine for each kind of thing, but I, I, it's absolutely radically changed my life. How do we view the church? Like, what is the church? And it's interesting, like, I know some people will say, I've really been hurt by the church. And like, how do we view the church? And it's like, for the Orthodox, 
the, the main kind of view of what the church is, is in the story of the Good Samaritan, you know, where he's traveled on the road, this, this unfortunate fellow, and been beat up and badly and had everything taken from him. And then, you know, it actually says a couple of priests come by, which is pretty good for priests to hear. And then, uh, and then the Good Samaritan. A Samaritan's traveling along the road. He sees this guy and he picks him up and he takes him to the inn. We, the inn, we view that as the church. Like, what is the church? The church is where the, the sick, broken guy who got beat up by the world and left for dead is taken to find healing. And he leaves him, he leaves him with enough money to care for him and oil to bind up his wounds. And he leaves him at the inn and says, take care of him. Whatever you need to pay extra, I will take care of it. Just heal this guy. We see the church as a hospital for sinners. And when I hear people say, I've really been hurt by the church, I'm like, well, yeah, it's uh, full of sinners. Like it's full of like people. And so we do get hurt. And sometimes priests hurt people. Misunderstandings usually are more things that happen. There's a lot of people that aren't saints. <laughs> They're just sinners. Uh, and so the hospital, like the medicine of immortality is the communion, the body and blood of Christ, the Eucharist. And the healing, the binding up of the wounds of people. And we are a kind of a sad lot, I think. I don't know if people were tougher back in a different time, but we're sort of psychologically weak. And the church heals those sins. So they, that's where the Lord acts and for the healing of the human person. The hospital is like full of sick patients and but they're all there they're all there with the hope of being healed and on the path of healing so they don't come to stay sick they come to get better and sometimes people don't but most of the time they do you know it works <laughs> it actually works so it's like to come and pray the prayers and and you know to lay aside worldly cares and to confess your sins how does the orthodox church think about sin I think the Orthodox Church has covered, like I should say, cornered the market on understanding original sin. And in the Orthodox Church, we do not believe that a child, an adult, is guilty of the, has, like say, carries the guilt of the sin of Adam. Adam and Eve sin, um, they disobey the Lord, and we don't have that, that, that now because sin has entered into the world, that we're guilty of the sins of our forefathers, we're guilty of the sins of our, like, ultimate forefather, Adam. We're, we stand before judgment, we'll stand for our own, before for our own sins. And what, we, what the truth of it is, when Adam and Eve sin, sin enters into the world, sin brings death, and so, you know, death goes for everybody because all men sin is the way it reads in Scripture. So if, if we didn't sin, if sin wasn't in the world, if the world hadn't fallen, you know, there, maybe there'd be like the Eden will still be going on, you know, a paradise. But, but sin did enter the world and we suffer from that. We do actually suffer from it. And frankly, it's in the air. Like, I don't know, I, there, everyone sins. You know, so um, there's no one born of, you know, woman who's without sin. Everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and this is true. But we don't answer. The system isn't like rigged, you know. It's just that we ourselves fall. So sin in the Orthodox Church is seeing anything that is outside of the life of God. It's, it's having things on our own terms. It's wanting and then taking what doesn't belong to us, or we go on and on about of those things, but it's knowing something apart from God. That's the way we would define sin. There may be other ways, but one way we would define sin is knowing something apart from God. And there's no one who lives who hasn't had that knowledge, you know, wanted to know something secretly apart from God. And Adam and Eve did it. You know, Adam and Eve took the forbidden fruit and knew it apart from God, tried to hide it. 
and then tried to hide themselves. And by the way, he goes after them. Where are you? It's the first, like, most amazing thing of the good news is right there in Genesis. You know, in the very beginning, Adam, where are you? Knowing where he is, knowing what he did. So we don't have, like, the, that God can't handle us anymore or God can't look at us anymore. I mean, if you don't mind, I'll push it all the way to the cross. When Christ is on the cross, we do not have the teaching that the Father turns away from the Son on the cross, that Jesus is taken on the sin of the world and God can't look on sin uh, is not a scriptural teaching at all. So what's happening on the cross is that Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us. He's come to save us of our sins. It's the thing that we're going to handle at Christmas you know, nativity of Christ. It's like, why did he come into the world? To save us from our sins. Our sins. If it was going to, it should actually read like if you believe in original sin, the way it's taught as like original guilt, um, then you'd have to, the proper scripture would have to be said something like he's come to save us from Adam's sin. But he's, he's come to save us from our sins. And we have plenty of them. And, you know, it doesn't take long, much reflection, to realize like, I don't think like the Lord. I don't act like the Lord. I don't love people the way the Lord loves them. You know, I hold the grudges. I've got my own issues and problems, sexual and all kinds of issues, whatever people have, you know, greed and all kinds of things. And in the church, like sin, I think it's St. Hermit of Alaska who said, sin does not in any way hinder us from the love of God. You know, sin does not keep the Lord away from us. We, we might run from the Lord like Adam did. We may do that. But the Lord doesn't go, oh, no, they're sinners. I don't like them anymore. I mean, Jesus, I mean, if you were going to look for like a main theme, is that God loves sinners. I mean, Jesus actually gets in trouble for it all the time. You know, why are you hanging out with those sinners? He's like, I mean, the shorthand answer is I love them. You know, because you think you're well, and there's nothing can be done with someone who thinks they're not sinners. But someone who is a sinner, the woman who comes and weeps at his feet, you know, and anoints his head with oil, and she's forgiven. She had much to be forgiven for, and she's forgiven much because of it. So.